My name is James Phillips, I'm a music teacher and father from the Watford Chapter here in the UK. And I'd like to talk to you about an educational website and piecing together for the movement called CZM Education. The purpose of this site is twofold. Firstly, I want to <coughs> present the existing studies that validate the educational proposals put forward by the Venus Project. And secondly, it's to collaborate with and help movement members to communicate these ideas with young people currently in mainstream education to help them to start to think differently about, the, about learning and the world in which they live by presenting the educational notions proposed in the resource based economy. The tenets of the resource based economy are wide ranging, of course, but for me they're based on two very firm footings. They are physical sciences and the humane application of them to social design. It's clear that the productive and relevant education for all with regards to these areas would be essential for such a society to function properly. Unfortunately, I know from working in schools that we are a long way from a productive and relevant education with regards to our species' sustainability and planet right now. The reason for this is simple. Education reflects culture, and culture reflects education. But just a cursory glance at human beings' conduct on this planet would surely seem enough to realise that both education and society as a whole need to undergo a significant change in values if we are to move into any sort of sustainable social structure. So how do education and culture reflect each other exactly? The main incentive system in the world today is money, which basically equals competition for profit. This was of course an excellent idea when we had a true scarcity of much needed resources for our survival. However, this does not need to be the case anymore, as we now have the technology to not only sustainably produce long-lasting goods in a relative abundance for all the Earth's people, but we can do so with little or no physical human labour at all and with far greater level of efficiency. So, in a new incentive system based on progress rather than profit, the, education, uh, the cultural and educational emphasis would be on finding new and creative solutions via the scientific method to solve problems rather than relying on arbitrary methods. Therefore, self-development, critical thinking, effective communication, collaboration and general knowledge of the subjects that have a direct correlation to the integrity of the planet and everyone on it would be the new educational power. Learning would be seen as a fun and lifelong pursuit. Instead of seemingly uh, stopping at a certain age so that you can earn some money to earn as much stuff as possible before you die. Punishment and reward is essential for a dysfunctionally rooted society such as ours to work at all, and is therefore the current dominant teaching and philosophy that is promoted in most schools today. Quite simply, the educational system is a natural byproduct of the society it's in, and vice versa. Whilst there may be, some positive change in education, it will never be significant enough in a society based explicitly on greed, differential advantage, and acquisition of incomes. Punishment is an easy behaviour or tactic to attack in terms of its ineffectiveness towards modifying behavior, uh, aberrant behaviour in the long term. As I'm sure everyone in this room is well aware, people act according to what they pick up from their environment. How many times do we have to hear that the abused become the abusers before we recognise and realise that we have to change the causal mechanisms behind these tendencies? So when a child is punished, the inappropriate behaviour is all but forgotten instantly. A chastised child will not be thinking of the errors of their ways, but will instead be thinking about the punishment brought upon them, how much they dislike the parent or teacher that inflicted it, as well as how they will go about not getting caught next time. <coughs> Children are not born bad, and teaching them right from wrong does not have to come in the form of discipline or bribes. For example, trying to help them to understand how their actions may have hurt another person's feelings is a pretty good starting point in attempting to instill in them a decent set of moral values. Above all, a child needs to feel appreciated for what they do, who they are, and who they want to be. Ultimately, they need to feel loved. Now, the seemingly nice twin to, punish, uh, to punishment in the act of behaviour modification is reward. Whilst this may at first glance seem to be a preferred route to take, it's not all it's cracked up to be. Because whilst prizes and praise may be effective in the short term, they can actually be detrimental to long term intrinsic creative motivation and will keep needing to be applied in order for the desired behaviour to continue. More on this soon. 
It's most important to point out the reasoning behind the desire to modify behaviour in the first place. Who are you doing it for and why? Because it's one thing to want to stop a child being violent or running across a busy road. <coughs> and quite another to tell them to stand still, be quiet, and in actual fact, they don't have to. This is really just an adult forcing their will upon a child in order to coerce them to act as they do, as well as attempting to impress other adults with how well they have their pet child trained according to behave to, uh, to the current social status quo and apparatus. So as mentioned earlier, it's the use of punishment and reward that really keeps our current social model working at all. School is no exception, and in fact, it can't be if the integrity of the system itself is to be maintained. Rewards seem to be the more part of the two behaviour modification methods currently used in education, so let's take a look at them now in more detail. Extensive research now shows that the use of rewards as an incentive to get a child to learn <coughs> leads to the students merely meeting the bare minimum of what is required of them in order to get the grade of reward on offer. Not only this, but it also has a significant impact to their long term intrinsic interest in a given task or subject, rather than, rather than them feeling enthusiastic, autonomous, and creative in what they're doing. This point is well made in the book Punished by Rewards by psychologist, author, and teacher Alfred Kerr. When we are working for a reward, <coughs> we do exactly what is necessary to get it, no more. Not only are we less apt to notice peripheral features of the task, but in performing it, we are also less likely to take chances, play with possibilities, or follow hunches that might pay off. Risks are to be avoided whenever possible, because the objective is not to engage in an open-ended encounter with ideas. It's simply to get a good. One example from the numerous studies that point to the detrimental effect the use of rewards has with regard to problem solving and general motivation was done at the University of Rochester. In this experiment, 20 children were taken into a room one by one to play with some puzzles. Half the kids were told they'd be given a $5 reward for each puzzle they tested, and half were not. Once these puzzles were completed, each child was left alone in the room for a few minutes and observed via a hidden camera. Of the ten children who were played for completing the puzzles, only one continued to play with them in these remaining few minutes. However, every single one of the ten who weren't played continued to play with them even though they didn't have to. Hopefully this study and many others, much like the work of Daniel Pink, who's well recognised in our movement, I'm sure some of you may be familiar with his work. Uh, hopefully this and other studies should make this point abundantly clear. Rewards kill long-term intrinsic motivation. Praise can surprisingly be detrimental as well, for it elicits the same action as any other reward mechanism. This is not to say that making relative or positive constructive comments about the working question or general encouragement is not, is not beneficial. But heaping praise on top of what should already be rewarding only detracts from the true sense of achievement an individual actually feels towards the task in question. The student then also starts to become dependent on the praise of an authoritarian figure in order to feel motivated to apply themselves to future tasks. Indeed, why is praise needed other than to encourage students to complete the tasks we set for them and that we deem worthy of praise? This further cements our position of dominance rather than allowing the child to pursue their genuine areas of interest with our help. So learning is currently the process to get rewards rather than the other way around. And then we wonder why kids are so disillusioned with learning in school. Please understand that a monetary based society demands a constant influx of wage slaves and the school is designed to be the perfect cookie cutting plant for just that. In the words of George Carlin, they, the rich elite, don't want a well educated public capable of critical thinking. They want people just smart enough to run the machines and do the paperwork, and just dumb enough to passively accept increasingly shitty machines. Try to teach some kids to be nice and share. 
And we wonder why the ever increasing amount of them are on, go on to being on antidepressants later on in life. Could it have anything to do with the fact that adults do the exact opposite of what they teach their own kids to do in their own day to day lives? So when a child, and you might, might have done this, I know I did, and that's why I had a very turbulent school career. Um, <laughs> but so when a child in school asks the teacher, why do I need to learn this, or how will I need this later on in life? The teacher replies, of course you need it, or because you have to. This masks the fact that the real answer is, in a streamlined job market, you probably won't. However, a school is largely a test of your character with regards to completing tasks, whether relevant or not, on time, to the required standard. This means that you will be a good worker in the marketplace. I should not question the merits of the task in hand, and instead make sure you do what you are told, when you are told to do it, to the best of your ability, even if you hate the task in question. There's another one for that's good slavery. For the abolish that.
to question the approach they're using to see if they feel it's getting the message across effectively into the right demographic. The simple fact is that the youth of today are more in tune with the notions of protecting the environment due to climate change and environmental issues now being propagated in the mainstream media and in schools. In my experience, they're ready to hear what we are saying with far more open mind than the older generations are. Also, on a more pragmatic note, they'll be around for a lot longer to be able to push in this direction than any other will be. That may seem harsh and cold, but it's true. We all have old schools, for example. Why don't we give them a see if you can do a presentation? In the UK, we have the perfect opportunity to do this with what's called citizenship lessons or general studies. I've never done a presentation of this kind before, but I'm a big believer in jumping at the deep end and learning to swim. So, I ended up talking to a captive audience of 180 kids and, uh, kids and teachers and a secondary school I teach at about the Zeitgeist Movement and the Venus Project. Thank you. 